Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Apologies for the slight delay in getting started. Um, we are still awaiting one of our panelists, but we'll get started without them here um, at respect for your time. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today to talk about training the next generation of climate change negotiators. Um, today's session is really about capacity building, both the programs that um, the Climate Youth Negotiator Program and the Dominican Republic have put together to train the next generation of climate change negotiators, but also about building capacity within you as our audience members. And so today's session will be quite interactive and we encourage you um, to be prepared to get up from your seats and look away from your phones um, at some point through our session. So let's kick off with a round of introductions. Um, my name is Sophie Dowd. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at the Future Leaders Network, um, and I am the co-founder of the Climate Youth Negotiator Programme. The Climate Youth Negotiator Programme is a, an, uh, a programme aimed at empowering and developing the next generation of climate change negotiators through training, community building, resources, and advocacy to pave the way for intergenerational leadership. And I'm looking forward to um, discussing a bit more about that with you alongside one of our youth negotiators here today. Um, I'd love my fellow panellists to introduce themselves, and I'll start off with you, Gabriella. Hello. Hi, my name is Gabriela Marquez. I am a consultant for the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources of the Dominican Republic. I currently work under the Capacity Building Initiative for Transparency the first CBIT project in the Dominican Republic, and I was one of the participants of the training programs. And thank you for being here. Hello, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Pedro Cos. I'm from the, uh, also a consultant from the Ministry of Environment of the Dominican Republic. I work as a monitor and evaluation manager for a project of creating capacity for finance in the country, climate finance, and I'm actually working as a lead negotiator of gender. Good afternoon. My name is Carola Cava. I'm also from the Dominican Republic. I was trained by the Climate Youth Negotiation Program, and I work at the Ministry of Environment of my country in the Capacity Building Initiative for Transparency as a communication specialist. Hello. My name is Claudia Caballero. I um, also work for Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources of the Dominican Republic, and I'm a negotiator on matters related to capacity building. Thank you. Um, and when our final panelist joins us, we will let her introduce herself to you um, so that you get to know all of the people that will be speaking with you today. Um, so today's session is going to be a mixture of events. The first part of it will be a panel discussion talking about two capacity building programs to train the next generation of climate change negotiators. And we'll tell you a little bit more about those in one second. And then the second element of this session is, um, is speed mentoring. Um, and so we will be spending um, a few minutes at the end of this session talking to each other about one challenge we're facing as individuals in the negotiations at this COP. And you'll be sharing it with a random stranger from this room. And um, hopefully together you can help overcome those challenges. Um, and then you'll do the same thing, but in reverse, where you'll help another person with their issue. Um, so please be prepared for that bit at the end of the session. And don't leave before it happens, because you'll miss out on the speed mentoring. And no one wants to do that. So um, let's get started with talking a little bit about the two um, capacity building programs that we are exploring here today. Um, Gabriella, would you be able to, would you like to introduce the, um, the Dominican Republic training program? Thank you, Sophie, again. So during the months of, uh, for 60 hours, the length of four months, the, Domin the Ministry of Environment of the Dominican Republic, alongside with the Academia, specifically Pontificia Universidad Católica Madre y Maestra, uh, with the, the financial support of uh, civil society and also the private sector, 
we're able to deploy this training program for more than 25 uh, participants, from including representatives from all of these um, sectors that I mentioned. It was a very inclusive and participatory process for all of us, and the most important thing was the, the ability to share with um, representatives that maybe in our daily life we don't have the opportunity, and also gain the knowledge from very uh, senior negotiators from the Dominican Republic. So I, I won't delve a lot into it. Uh, and so we, with the questions, maybe we can get into more details. Oh, uh, very important detail. Uh, more than 60% of the participants were females, and the average age was around uh, 30, age, uh, 30 years of age. So it was very diverse. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriella, um, for sharing a little bit more about the Dominican Republic training program. Um, so the Climate Youth Negotiator Program, um, which is run by the Future Leaders Network, um, is, uh, is actually very complementary to the Dominican Republic's training program, but I guess it has a more global and international aim. Um, the program was founded by four young women, so in the spirit of gender um, empowerment, um, based on what Gabriella just said, um, based on the fact that um, climate change negotiations are the only way to secure international agreements to protect the planet, um, but there is no global process to make sure that we have the negotiators of the future, the, nego the skilled, effective negotiators who will achieve cooperative and collaborative and transformative change in these negotiations. So we took it upon ourselves to change that. Um, just back in January this year, we had this idea of creating this program, and it was launched uh, on Earth Day in April 2022 at the Global Youth Summit co-hosted by Young Go and March for Science um, in Dallas in the US. The program works by working directly with countries of which the Dominican Republic is one of them. They nominate a young person and then that young person receives four strands of support. The first is an intensive training program. It lasts five months and over hundreds of hours, um, mostly online, to teach them the technical, institutional um, negotiation and soft skills that they need to be effective climate change negotiators. The second thing that we do is we do community building, which supports our young negotiators to, to form connections and collaborations across delegations to increase the cooperation in negotiations. The third thing we do is we offer travel and subsistence grants for um, negotiators from lower income or global south countries to maximize participation and tackle climate and ensure climate justice. Um, and lastly, we, we carry out advocacy work um, to pave the way for intergenerational leadership. In our first year, we have trained 60 young negotiators from 27 countries. Um, and 55 of those young negotiators are here at COP. Um, and some of them are in this room, um, including Carola. Um, but lots of them are in the negotiations right now, representing their countries across a whole range of tracks, um, putting to use the very skills that we, um, that we help them to develop through the program. So now that you've got a bit of a flavor of the two organizations and, and programs that are here um, today, I thought we would start off with some questions. Um, and I am going to take the role of moderator, as unfortunately our co-moderator co isn't here just yet. She's been held up on urgent business. Um, we hope this to be a really informal dialogue, and so you'll see that whilst I'll address the question to one person, we encourage all panelists to speak up at any time. And indeed, if you have any questions in the audience at any point, please feel free to raise your hand and we'll either pick them up as we go along or we'll, we'll, we'll get them at the end of the session. So, to kick us off, um, Pedro, I'd like to turn to you. Um, in your experience, what were the main barriers or gaps in capacity building on climate negotiations in your region? Um, the, well, let's structure them. I believe there were five major gaps and barriers uh, during this capacity building that we have recognized. The first one was the financial resources. That is because you have this program, a specific program in that specific moment, but that doesn't imply continuity if, we, if you don't guide the resources to, to follow up the program. And that is something that the government is working on, you know, to have it established as a continuous program, but it's a really huge barrier. 
then going within the negotiation structure and what we learned during the program, the UNFCCC structure, modalities, the institution, all the information about it, even though you get the capacitation once you are here negotiating firsthand, in my case, first COP negotiating, even though I have the technical idea of it, put it into practice requires a lot of efforts and experience. And it is just one course is not enough, you know? One really difficult one, a gap and barrier is the language, like the language gap. Uh, we come from a Spanish-speaking country. We have to translate everything in our brains first when you are dealing with the negotiation process. So it's really, it's really hard sometimes when you have people with different accents. It's not your native language. You know, it's, it's kind of a, one of the major tricks. Also, that barrier uh, is related to the next one is the gap of privilege within peoples in the country. The first uh, barrier of privilege regarding the negotiation process and being able to negotiate is the language because when you come from a private bank, a background of education, it's easier for you to learn other languages and not the case when you talk about the public, nego uh, public system. Uh, sometimes it's more difficult to be able to get really good teachers in that sense. And the other one is, so when we were taking the, the course, the capacitation, and having the practices, uh, something that came up was uh, about the private education background. People were able to have the UN model in their, in their background education, and while the others didn't have it. So those were the major gaps and barriers we have as starting negotiation this, from the point of view of the project. Yeah, I think I think there's some really really important barriers actually, and I mean funding is such a huge challenge to to bring people to COP, and um, it is no mean feat to travel halfway around the world um, to get here. But once you are here, inclusion is equally as important. Um, I think we talk a lot about language and how important that is in the negotiation process. You know, whether you use the word should or shall or will or would. Um, it changes everything and if English isn't your first language it can be uh, a disadvantage if you're not able to kind of engage in that in, in the same way I think I think that's really really powerful thank you um, does anyone else have any thoughts on on that that point around the barriers to capacity building well um, I totally agree with Pedro like one of the barriers that personally I have uh, first of all was the language because of course uh, we come from a country that Spanish is our mother language and then getting used to it all the words that you just were telling uh, Sophie regarding the shawl, the may, the consider and stuff like that with, that we had to use to draft text or work on text it was really um, like time demanding for me uh, I had to read a lot of books and stuff regarding negotiation texts in order to accomplish like uh, the assignments that we had on the on the training program. Also, I totally agree with agree with what Pedro says about the opportunities of the language for the per, the people that does not um, had the opportunity again to be in a private school regarding to the people that are attending or attend that public, uh, public speaking, public school. Uh, it's really, um, it was, I think it's really a gap for us in the country. Um, and of course, the structure of the UNFCCC. Oh my God, it's, it's way different when you come here to the cup and you have to see the screens. To, in order to see the agendas, and it's, it's not the same when you were trained like, okay, that's the Substat, this is the SBI, this is the CUP, this is the CMA. But when you're here, like in action, it's really hard to keep track of every, like every acronym and stuff like that. So I think it was like a, a barrier for me also. Yeah, I, I love that actually because living negotiations is very different to thinking about negotiations. I don't know whether any of you have um, been into those negotiation rooms, but the huddles and the informals and the inf infs and 
the different mechanisms and levers for influence are so crucial, but no one can teach you about them by seeing words on a page. Um, so in, in the Climate Youth Negotiator Program, we, we culminate all of our virtual training with an in-person simulation, negotiation simulation, which is really important to be able to do that. But that also takes time and money to be able to run. And so it just shows how, how kind of entrenched and how important it is to tackle those issues um, as part of that. I can see you want to come in, Carola. Go for it. Go for it, pal. No, I was just going to say that, in, in effect, like we had uh, mock-ups and when we had the in-person training here in Cairo before Cup, but even though it's like it's really hard to to keep track of everything, like it's not the same when you're in situ, like when you're here. So yeah, I just wanted to support your opinion on that. And I guess just just to build on that question, because I think Pedro, you, you touched on some really big structural and procedural issues. But at the end of when you were speaking, and I think Carilla has mentioned this as well, some of the softer skills that are the kind of part of the capacity of participating in in negotiations, I would love it from to hear from you as negotiators. What are those softer skills? What helps you to be an effective negotiator? And how can you develop those skills? For one. Uh, I can go for one soft skill that has helped me a lot, and it's kind of a weird one, but um, empathy. Like, being able to read people with empathy, you can feel what they're feeling about whatever you are suggesting as a country. Masks makes it really difficult. There are some negotiators that are wearing masks inside the room, but when they don't have it, it's easier for you to know when to speak, when to introduce a topic, when to ask for something and what things you consider that are, they can consider that are not okay, they, they won't with that, you know? So the best thing is that empathy is a soft skill that I consider really, really important in these uh, scenarios. Yes, to add a little bit of that, I would say also patience. <laughs> even though, even in the process of learning, you have to be very patient to understand that you're gonna, you're not gonna become an expert in two days. So, and when you're here and you have a hot topic that's on the agenda, you might spend 20 hours in a room, and you have to be there representing and standing up for for the interests of your group. So, I would say that's a very important skill to develop. <laughs> Love it. Uh, Claudia, any thoughts? I think uh, everyone has covered what, what I want to say, but also uh, I want to remark the, the, the passion, the passion that we, we have to, to, to do, uh, that we, we, we have to do when we are uh, passing so many hours the, into the negotiations. Uh, for me, it's so hard to uh, was so hard to understand the structure of the UNFCCC, uh, the SBI, the SABSTA, the uh, CMA, CMP, and uh, how it all works. Uh, and uh, this is uh, and, and also the language. The language uh, it's, it's hard. It can be hard too. Yeah, absolutely. I think. Um You've all picked up on some of the, the crucial skills that are just hard to be able to teach on like a Zoom call, right? Um, and yet they are so crucial to being a really effective negotiator and shows just how much investment has to go into place to be able to, to create the next generation. Sure. Amazing. So um, we've, we've kind of discussed some of the points that really need addressing when, um, to, to build the next generation of, of climate change negotiators. Um, Clearly, though, those skills um, and all of that knowledge cannot be delivered by one individual or institution alone. Um, what partnerships did the Dominican Republic employ to help ensure that those skills and knowledge was, were kind of imparted correctly? Is it cloudy? In, for Dominican Republic, uh, we already established an agreement between academia, uh, social, uh, civil society, private sector, public sector, to develop um, uh, 
to develop uh, training programs or academic programs that can enhance the current capacities and can um, build new capacities on matters related to uh, climate change, uh, specifically uh, for negotiations. Um, this, I think I consider this is so important to ensure the um, uh, sustainability of the, of the capacity building process and also the financial sustainability of the program. As Pedro mentioned before and Carola, uh, this is a big challenge for developing countries uh, to guarantee the financial uh, support of this type of programs. Uh, also, uh, I, I would like to mention or to add that uh, univer university or academia has um, uh, a fundamental role to generate, uh, generate quality information and establish solid uh, research lines or research, research areas on topics related to climate change and also um, environmental topics. Uh, to uh, answer the, the real problems, uh, or the real needs of society in terms of uh, adaptation and mitigation to climate change. Fantastic. Um, it sounds like a, a, an amazing program that Dominican Republic young people were able to access. Um, it's really exciting. Um, oh, yeah, please, go ahead. Fred. So I also wanted to add uh, this, this kind of events and conferences help the country to get in, into networks that maybe in other settings it wouldn't be possible. And this year we had also the opportunity to join the Climate Reality Project, which is another training program. And we, have, uh, we had more than 30 participants in, in, that, in that training. And we have two Dominicans that joined the delegation this year. Uh, that were beneficiaries of that program. So I think it's good also to take advantage of these kind of the scenarios to create the partnerships to enable that this kind of program continue and make sure that they are open to everyone for, that's interested in participating. So that's it. Okay. You wanted to keep it informal, yeah. so I'm going to share our experience. Um, I was part of a program that was about climate policy as a teacher because I've been doing climate action as a technician for a period of time. When I heard Carol, she was talking about this new course that we will start, the one that we participated, I was like, I want to be part of it, not as a teacher, I want to be part of it as a student because they included something called mob negotiations. And having that knowledge delivered by them with the support of the private sector, the civil society, and the academia. I, 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 I have been part of that structure as a teacher in other topics, and I know, I know for sure, because you have all those different point of view getting in touch and involved in that process. Whatever you are going to learn there, you learn there is good. Like, when those programs are structured, you're not only receiving the perspective of the government or just the private sector to fulfill a need. No, you're having the perspective of the academia, what the country needs, the government, what's our priorities right now, private sector, what we support and want to start having the capacity to support in the country, you know? That, that kind of perfect, constructive perspective, it being the student wasn't amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I mean, that's SDG 17, right? Like, partnerships are the way forward. Um, and it's, it's really exciting to see all those perspectives brought together. Um, I'm going to wrap up this question. Um, Carola, um, tell us a little bit about the different people that you, um, that you heard from when, when you were on the Climate Youth Negotiator Program. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Don't worry, I caught you in the middle. Um, I was going to say, tell us a bit about the, the range of speakers that you encountered on the program and oh, the benefits yeah. that that may or may not have brought. Yes, uh, we had a lot of great teachers and speakers on, on the climate youth negotiation programs. Uh, every one of them, they were specialists in different areas of interest, like, I don't know, like adaptation, like capacity building, mitigation. Uh, we even had, for example, the opportunity to be uh, or to have meetings with Cristiana Figueres, for example. That's something that probably, um, I don't know, like other person or people haven't had the chance to meet her. And we had a conversation. We, we had sessions that it was called In Conversation With, 
where we were able to get, have meetings with these important people like her and like the elders and stuff like that. So yeah, we had a lot of uh, great speakers and, and teachers that guide us through the main uh, like topics that we need to know right before we came to CUP. So it was really interesting. Like We had the opportunity of meeting great people and professionals. Good afternoon, colleagues, and apologies for being late. I was negotiating, and I got into a mess before coming here, so I wasn't allowed to come at that point. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Carol Franco. I am the advisor for the Ministry of Environment on Nature-Based Solutions. I was also a review editor for the IPCC, and I was the coordinator of the course on negotiations, uh, which was based on trying to... Um, basically prepare the next generation of negotiations to be able to come to the COP and support our country. And now I would like, ask, like to ask a question um, to Gabriela, which is, what do you think about the methodologies implemented in the training programs you participated, and how can they be replicated in other scenarios? And, and what do you think, um, I would say, was useful and what would you think you would improve? Sure, so that's a uh, very ample question, but I'll try to be very concise. So I, as I mentioned before, the this academic program was 60 hours and we had um, virtual classes, in-classroom classes, and then at the end we had the three-day in-session mock negotiations. So that was a very interesting methodology because the reason why we had uh, online trainings was because we had um, international uh, professors conducting some of the lectures so uh, but what actually helped a lot was the the in-person trainings because that's where you get the, the more conversation going so I think that's it's, it's really important to to maintain these kind of trainings in, at the more grounded level and having also the intersectionality between these seniors, negotiators that have been coming to 10, 15 cups before us and trying to share that knowledge with us. It's, it's, it's very valuable. Another thing that I also enjoyed from this program was the, the diversity from the participants. Um, I think I've never been in such a diverse group in terms of um, sectors represented in, in one academic program and that knowledge that someone can bring from the from the banking sector into into these topics is very useful to understand certain process so I think the, those two are the most valuable and so what I would replicate in future trainings is maintaining that and also making sure that you have you have representation of every sector of, of, of the society, and definitely the the practical uh, exercise because you cannot. It, it it it's okay to read and learn and hear from from these experts, but when you are in a safe space to practice and to make mistakes and being getting feedback on what you could do better and coming here. Uh, with those answers, questions by people who you can trust and consult, it's crucial to gain this confidence in being here representing your country. So I thank you for the experience. Um, thank you so much, Gabriela. And I have another question right now, but also um, Gabriela has the, had the unique opportunity to have participated in the negotiations before taking the course. And very briefly, in two minutes, and I remember you made a lot of comments about it. What, what was going through your mind coming first here and then taking the course? So before... I, I, I went to Glasgow last year, and it was, it was my first cup, and it was overwhelming. <laughs> Everything was overwhelming. And, but after that, you, you start building some confidence, and then after Glasgow, I, I took the training. One thing I learned, it's, 
it's never enough. <laughs> you have to keep uh, up to date with uh, the because the change the topics change. But something that I was able to enhance during this training was body language. <laughs> it was something we touch upon during during the during the workshop. It's it's. Uh, it's an opportunity for, for everyone to... And Caro was very straightforward with me. Like, you cannot let people read you. So <laughs> that, has been very, that fe feedback has been very helpful. Thank you, Gabriela. And I have another question. Um, and it's, I will ask the panelists to comment on the results of the training process and exposure. And I will... I will start with Carola, but this is open to anyone else that is, would be interested in sharing their experience. Um, well, f for me, it was a great experience. First of all, I'm the only one in this table, I think, that did not study anything that has to do with environment, environmental science or stuff like that. I come from the community. I'm a communicator. That's my major based on and for me even though I have a year and a half working for the Ministry of Environment as a communications specialist and I know some things about uh, environment environment it was really you know it was challenging for me because I had to study like since I had 18 years years old and I'm putting my feet for the first time in the university so it was really um, it was a challenge for myself but it was, uh, I, think I, I think I did good <laughs> on my trainings. Um, I had a wonderful experience. I was one of the last participants that was uh, like signed in the program. So for me, I had to study every single day. I had to catch up with the whole team and watch four videos of each training session. It was like, I don't know, how many, Sophie? Like, uh... Six modules. Six modules? Yeah. And each one Five had modules, two and each one eight hours, right? Yeah. Eight hour recording sessions. And besides that, we had, like, readings that we had to do before the other uh, session. So it was a really intense, but it was a great experience, especially when we came here to Cairo to do the in-training person when in training sessions and we could like meet all the well some some of my colleagues are right here sitting and we could meet each other and work as a group it was really great to uh, learn about other cultures learn about um, or learn from my other colleagues who are experts in this area besides not not my case of course and I, I really like the experience. I think I'm, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna tell like my young people of the Minecraft, my colleagues and stuff like that to uh, join these kind of trainings because I think it's really important before coming to their first cup. This is my first cup. Before coming to cup to um, like strain their abilities and skills of negotiation skills and capacities. So for me, it was really awesome. Um, I wouldn't change it, anything at all, at this point, at least the one, the training that I had the opportunity to be part of. Thank you. Anybody else, any of the panelists wanna add something? Pedro, I see you're dying to say something. So basically, can you comment on the results of the training process and your experience? What would you like to share with us? Well, the things that I will share the most with everyone of, of, out of that experience was knowing the path that peer, people like Carol, uh, Dr. Vinas, not here right now, uh, have experienced when they started doing this for the country. Like, they show us a lot of instruments and techniques to be able to survive in this environment. We are surviving, thriving, and doing it good, we believe, because of the feedback we have received. But I have taken the moment to analyze how, how they felt in that moment without any guidance. And you were really, really cool being that person that I set up for the country and did things without knowing, like, 
it's a lot of pressure, even though I know positions of my country that we have uh, through our Ministry of Internal Affairs, I know the technical stuff because I study science as a basis. There are moments when you're passionate about a topic and you are going for something, but you, because you have all that, that info, you know you cannot go that far, you know? And they weren't able to receive all that information that I had, all that you have to look at this, this, and that before going there. They realized that their own, and being able to be part of a program created by people that have experienced that and wanted to share that knowledge is, is amazing. Uh, really, really cool. Yeah, I think it's um, just to kind of add on, on this, I think there's mul multiple levels on which this capacity building changes things, I, I personally think. I think um, Carola talked about the kind of the personal transformation. Um, that very specifically you had, but I actually think lots of people had as well, learning so much about a very intricate and complicated process. Um, for any young person, no matter how much you know about climate change, it doesn't equip you to know how the UNFCCC works. That's a whole new science in and of itself. And I think, um, I think there's something there. I think there's also a kind of community transformation. And, and I really see that just having met the Dominican Republic um, kind of young negotiators who, who, who took part in their program, you know, a community, a sense of, of belonging that, you know, I'm, it's a real pleasure to, to meet you and, and kind of interact with you. And it very much mirrors the, the pleasure that I have when I interact with our cohort of young negotiators who have, have formed something very special that is bigger than just themselves. And, and then I think, I personally think there's like a systems level impact that having all of these young voices in the negotiations genuinely changes things. Um, I loved, actually, um, Gabriella, you mentioned earlier, you have to have patience. Um, I think young people have patience, but actually one of their best qualities is their impatience and their ability to, to kind of push the negotiations forward and drive urgency. And we've already heard of examples of where young negotiators who've met each other through these type of programs have found consensus and compromise that their more senior counterparts couldn't reach because they knew each other as humans and not as people sitting on the other side of the table as part of a competition. And I think that's, that's a real transformation. That is what's going to change these negotiations from going at a snail's pace to something else. Um, and I'm really confident that the programs that, that we're both talking about are, are delivering something very special um, in, in that respect at, at all those different levels. Um, Carol, was there anything else you wanted to add on that? No, I think uh, we cover everything and I just want to say that I th coordinating this program and seeing how when we were doing the mock negotiations the group went from day one to day two and how much they improve and learn so fast. It was amazing. We had people from the Ministry of Environment there um, looking at, uh, watching what was happening, and they were all very amazed and, and proud of, to see how the group, basically we had two different mock negotiations, so they really got into it, and all of them really excel on it and really uh, portrayed um, their role as, as negotiators. And um, I think this is something that we can keep doing for the next generations. This, is an, this was a very nice group, but also it can be extrapolated to other countries. And the program can be done in different places, but also there will always be new generations coming up that we can um, continue to train. Uh, I just wanted to say something that I think is really important like to all of, to all of us is that we all received the support of our government and that was really important to us. Like for example, I don't know, well, most of you probably don't know the, our country, the Dominican Republic, but we currently here at COP are one of the youngest delegation of the whole COP and that's because of the commitment that's, that our country has with youth leadership. And I think that's really important to mention because I know that unfortunately there are other countries that does not have that chance, or other youth leaders don't have that chance in their own countries. And our government is supporting us a lot. They, they are like some of us, not, not all of us, like Pedro is the lead negotiator of gender. 
Um, Claudia is the lead negotiator of capacity building, and Gabriela is the lead negotiator of transparency. And in general, like in this table, we are, the three of us, we are below the 35 years old, and it's our first experience, at least at COP. Pedro, this is your first one also, right? So I think that's really important, like the, the support of the government of everyone's country. And maybe that's why I think these two programs succeed and we can see the results here in this table and in the negotiator, negotiation tables also. Fab, thank you. Um, so we're going to conclude the panel session now. Um, and I'd like to ask everyone on the panel, um, if you had one minute, maybe we'll make it less, 30 seconds with world leaders. I mean, it's the ministerial meetings today. If you had 30 seconds with all of those world leaders, what would you tell them about what they need to do to equip and, and prepare the next generation of climate change negotiators? And I'm going to start at this end because I was looking at you, Gabby. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> what comes to my mind is coherence between what we say here and the actual uh, work that we go back home. How, how do we transform everything that's happening here into quick, deliverable action? So coherence between what we say here and ground work now. Uh, this is difficult because the first thing I will say is we need loss and damage mechanisms and also <laughs> we need coherence not only for capacity building, uh, for this topic, but coherence in many uh, transversal topics on climate action. About having this kind of opportunity, we need support. Like, we still need support and need more spaces, and we need more inclusivity of young people, women, and, of course, more inclusivity, structural inclusivity for indigenous people, uh, local communities, and people from different backgrounds and languages to really get to negotiate or transform the negotiation system for them to be able to understand this context. Wow, this is a very hard question <laughs> to answer. Um, I would like to say uh, we need capacity building, technology transfer, and finance to implement uh, adaptation, adaptation and mitigation uh, actions. Uh, adaptation is a priority for our, uh, our country. We are from Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic, Republic is an island and adaptation is a priority for us uh, because we are uh, living uh, the, the hazards of uh, climate change, uh, related climate change. So we need money, uh, capacity building, and transfer to implement adaptation uh, uh, actions. Um, it's a really hard question for me, um, but I think the first thing maybe that I would say is there's no planet, planet B. This is where we are living, like this is our planet, and we have to do something because we don't have an option and we need to act like immediately. I know young people, it's impatient as you said. So yes, we need to implement all those, all those things that we are supposed to be agreeing here today in the tables at COP, in the negotiation tables. We need to do it, but not for, uh, until 2030. It's now. It's like when we got back home, we need to start doing every single action plan that we are agreed on. So I think that's it. That, that would be my, question, my answer to the question. Thanks, Carol. Carola. Um, Carol, what would you say to them? That's a very easy question. Answer for me. I will say go back to the IPCC. We have a very tiny window where we can act. So let's go back to facts. Let's go back to science. That's what we should be focusing about in order to develop policies and do what we need to do. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really uh, great moment to end on, right? I think 
um, I would say the same thing. We're, we're running out of time and young people are pretty good at realizing that we're running out of time. Um, get them more involved in the negotiations, equip them with the skills, knowledge, resources and networks they need to be effective. Um, and maybe give them your jobs. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe young, young prime ministers and presidents of the world going forward. Um, okay, well, thank you so much to my fantastic panel. Um, and my wonderful co-moderator, um, who very kindly joined us <laughs> despite the, being in the middle of negotiations. So thank you for, for, for taking the time. Um, can we have a round of applause, please? Um, okay, and we are now going to move on to our speed mentoring session. So here is how... Oh, questions. Yeah, you're right. Questions. I haven't done questions. Um, I'll pause my speed mentoring thought, and I will invite questions from the floor. I can see one at the front here, and I can see one over there. Um, we'll come to you in that order, and, and we'll take two at a time and answer them together, if that's all right. Oh, yeah, and we've got a microphone for you. Yeah, yeah, please come and grab it. Sorry, we don't have a helper. Thank you. So, um, do you feel that other delegations are taking you seriously as young people? Because uh, I feel like, of course, you could be taken seriously, but a lot of people, especially older men, tend to not take you seriously because uh, these are just like, you know, stupid, radical young people or they feel that you are like a trophy. Like, yeah, we have the young re representation, but that's it. Does anyone want to answer? I can, I can, I can do it. Go for it. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and answer. So I think that's... I think we mentioned that at the beginning, the thing of confidence. You have to come here mentally prepared, even though if you... And that's something that I say to myself, because I'm, I, I'm, I look young. People ask for my ID. <laughs> Not here, but outside here. So, but you have to take advantage of the opportunities with, with these other delegations to show your knowledge, even though if it, even if it's not on the on negotiation table, maybe it could be outside on a coffee or on a networking event, and make sure that your country's uh, interests are put up in the table in every chance you get uh, to meet them. I think that's a, a quick strategy to first get to know them because perceptions are in everyone's mind, but we have to clear them by taking action. That would be my answer to that. Fantastic. Anybody else? Go for it, Go for it Pedro. Uh, I will tell you to recall that you're representing a country. Like, you are not you in that moment. You are the country. And even if you are in a meeting between your delegation and they do not respect you as they are supposed to, remember that you have an important topic recognized by the convention and you are doing your work here for that topic. So for the different spaces with other countries, you are a country, you represent your country, and you have to be confident, as the governor mentioned about it, and believe that you have the voice of the whole people you are left in behind when you took up a plane to get here. And... When you are in between your delegation, that it tends to happen too. There are people that are really machista and won't take you into consideration because you're young, you're a girl. You just tell them you are not you in that moment. You are the person in charge of that topic and they need to respect you and put it the importance that the delegation has defined because you are here for that. Carola? Yeah, so I think it's, it's such a good question, right? And I think it's really variable. You can see, like, the Dominican Republic clearly cares a lot about young people and respects them, you know, for their age or regardless of, for their, of their age or both. Um, I think there are definitely examples where that's not the case. Um, so one of our, one of our negotiators um, had to stand in for their, head nego their lead negotiator. Um, they have a very small delegation, and at the very start, their, their lead negotiator was sick. And so in many of the kind of pre, um, you know, heads of negotiation, heads of delegation meetings, she would go to the meeting and people would go, who are you? You're not, you know, the, the essence was, you're not one of us. And I think there's a real range of people having seen the same faces in the same places for the last 40 years. And so when a new person comes along, it's challenging to them and it's difficult. 
I don't think it's anything malicious. I think it's just um, unfamiliarity. And uh, I think it, but I do think it's changing. And the more young faces we can have in those rooms, and the more that it's clear that our young negotiators are as equipped and as effective as some more senior negotiators, more old, older negotiators, I'll, I'll put it that way, um, I think that changes minds, you know, learning by doing instead of just telling. You have a wonderful question. Thank you. I feel like that leads right into what I'm about to ask. Um, I'm in a negotiation and conflict resolution certificate program at my university, and this is my first COP, and I feel like there's very little room for the youth voice. I'm really excited to hear about the story about the Dominican Republic and how y'all are able to be part of that negotiation, but I am come from a country, and it feels like there's no way for me to get in contact with people and to have my voice feel heard, and I've interacted with some other young people who feel the same way and I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on how to work those connections or how to get involved and make your voice feel heard at the negotiations especially when things feel pretty dire right now with in terms of climate change and things not really getting done and feeling like it's just a bunch of old especially white men I don't know in, in my government <laughs> that are making the decisions for the youth I don't want to be <laughs> mansplaining thin here on the only man, but this question is really close to my knowledge. Excellent. I was the person in charge of uh, doing the chapter on Action for Common Empowerment in our NDC. So the first thing you need to look at is that the structure, uh, your governments are structured to deliver information and to engage with the UNFCCC. Like, how, what, what are the channels you have to take your message there? We have the Alcoys, we have the Declaration of Youth, we have informal consultations within the country. You need to be aware of the channels where they can hear your voice. That's the first thing, the, the one that you as a group of young people could have to deliver your message. But now that you are here, you can actually get to your delegation and start these little conversations and start putting the... Um, Planting the seed of what of your problems and your necessities to be heard. Also, the most important thing for me that was my way out to being heard and being able to participate was to start working on the thing. Like I thought to myself, how can I make a real change? And when I was analyzing, I have the channels that I mentioned to you. I can come to people and ask them for things, but I can work too. So I started working and and guiding my, my professional pathway to one that I can be heard and be the voice and get the message that for me and for the people that I represent. And that, that's the other way that I can invite you to do. If I may ask something, um, I think that's a great question. I bring students, I work also in uh, United States, Virginia Tech, and I bring students as a study abroad here. So these students have the opportunity. I, first of all, I did Virginia Tech and Observer Organization. I went through all the paperwork. That's the first step. And then I started bringing students. I have since 2017 bringing students every year, except for COP year that we had COVID. Um, and this year was I had six students here. So that also gave them uh, a perception. They were able to be here to see climate change development uh, policies at the highest level. My three students from last year, they all changed their majors to climate change. They're all doing masters in climate change. They all want a job in climate change. And that was not me pushing. They just came here and saw the need for it. And they started telling everybody about it. And this year, for example, I was able to, one of my students came as a party overflow to the Dominican delegation so she could see negotiations from inside. So also find a champion in your countries at the different levels that could also help you bridge that gap between um, you or your group and the government and try to start um, meeting these people here and showing all that you're capable of doing but also having meetings there and trying to, to reach out to them and, and show them how important it is. I think those are the, some ideas that could help you really move forward. I must say I'm very proud of my country that is very open to, to the youth 
and very open to bring people with the capacity to come here and negotiate and prepare them and, um, and bring the opportunity, give the opportunity to all, all of us actually to be part of this. Um, Carol mentioned that uh, you can like meet with champions, that's what you said, right? That you can find a champion. A champion. For you. Yes, but you can be that champion. Actually, in our delegation, we have uh, one of the lead of adaptation negotiator, negotiations. I remember I met him when he was like 16 years old, and he just started to meet other young people that were uh, like um, that they were concerned about climate change. And he started an NGO, an organization, and now, for example, he belongs to our delegation as a, as a lead in adaptation. Why? Because he started to go to the media, he started to do some small actions regarding climate change, he gathered all the youth people, and he, he was like, people started to notice him. People started to notice him even though the Ministry of Environment. And that is why he's, he's actually, right now, besides that, he's, um, how do you say that? What is it? He's an advisor of the Ministry of Environment regarding youth, adaptation, oceans, and stuff like that. So you can also be that champion. You can start the movement in your own university. You're here already. Got the, I mean, you have the opportunity to meet a lot, of, a lot of youth here and to start a movement by yourself. I think that's a good idea. Amazing. Um, and we're going to go to our last question. Thank you, everyone. Um, on the front row. Thank you. Uh, my name is John. I work with Action Against Hunger. And congratulations for the young negotiators. Uh, I feel so honored to see you guys take the podium and... You're also good in how you're expressing yourself, so that's a plus. Um, I'm just curious to know, and maybe for the side, how many African countries, um, you've, you've talked about 60, so maybe it would be interesting to know how many African countries you've also reached out in terms of training. Uh, that will also help us in terms of building a network. And number two, maybe from your stories, have you ever had a, a situation where you've reached us, um, you know, you're at crossroads. Somebody has approached you with certain interest on a very intriguing topic. Uh, you know, we know that people have interest right now during COP and issues on climate change. Some are very, I would say, thorny issues. And so as young people have you ever faced interest, somebody wants to compromise you, they have approached you with some very nice deal, you know, and maybe they want you to uh, relent from your hard stance and change your mind and maybe compromise the whole situation. So it will be interesting to, to answer those two. Thank you. Sorry, could you repeat the first question? I clearly didn't realize that was directed at me. <laughs> okay, so the first question was on the, um, how many African countries that you've been able to reach out and that we could build a more a bigger network because Africa is becoming the youngest continent now and it will be good to have more additional negotiators to, to talk about our case. Thank you. Apologies. I heard network and I didn't hear um, I didn't hear the beginning bit of that question, so thank you. Um, yeah, you're 100% right. I mean, the, the world's population, nearly kind of 56% of it is under the age of 35, but the majority of those young populations are in, in Africa um, and other developing countries. So I think youth representation in those countries in particular is the most important. Um, we have, I believe, six African countries on board. Chad, Liberia, Ghana, Nigeria, the Gambia, and I may have forgotten one other. Oh, Libya wanted to join but wasn't able to um, get through the, the paperwork at the very last minute, so we were five. Um, we want to reach out to more. I mean, this is our first year. Um, you know, we started in, in January with this idea. We launched in April. We went through word of mouth. 
but we welcome other countries to participate in the program. Um, we genuinely want young people as negotiators for all countries around the world. Um, and if any of you have any connections with your country and you would like to help us create that project and that program in your country, we'd be more than happy to do so. And then the second question, would anyone else like to pick up? I, I can touch upon the second question. I haven't been in that situation yet. I guess maybe one day I'll be in that position, but I think one of the things that helped me to, again, being confident of being part of the delegation is the, the relationship we have created and the network between us as a, being part of a project and the, and the government. So besides the training, after we completed and successfully uh, finished the training, we maintain contact with, with the experts, with the professors, so maybe you can always... Um, consult them, and before coming to the COP, we had uh, meetings in the Ministry of Environment, so we had very clear guidance on how to uh, act here and, and when to uh, request assistance from our senior delega uh, uh, delegates. So I think it's, it's what you need, it's very clear communication between you as a young negotiator and your head negotiators. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so that brings us to the end of our panel. Um, actually now, not prematurely when I, when I said earlier. Um, thank you so much to, to all of our speakers. You are honestly really very fantastic. Um, this is now our moment to celebrate you as a fantastic audience. So um, we only have five minutes left, but I'd like us to use it wisely. Um, I would like it that you didn't walk straight out that door. Um, and that you spent five more minutes investing in your own capacity. Um, so in a minute or so, I'm going to ask you to stand up and speak to one person in the room that you have not spoken to before, and I would like you to share with them one challenge you are facing here at COP in terms of the negotiations, and the other person will help you to solve it. And then at two and a half minutes, I'll ask you to switch around, and then I'll draw it to a close um, immediately after that. But before we do that, can we just have a huge round of applause to the fantastic panel? Okay, so up, up you get, or move around please to find someone you've not spoken to before. And uh, I will start two and a half minutes on the clock to share a challenge you've encountered at this COP that you would like some help with. 